Support for this podcast and the following message come from Money Mind from Prudential, a podcast powered by your financial behavior. Hear insights from financial psychologists, experts, and more. Download and subscribe to Money Mind wherever you find podcasts and learn more at slate.com slash money mind. Guess what? Ask Me Another is back on the road, and Nashville, we are headed to you. Jonathan Colton and I are headed to Music City with a suitcase full of our best puzzles, word games, and trivia. So join us and special guests for a live taping on September 13th at the War Memorial Auditorium. Tickets and information about how to be a contestant at amatickets.org. Game on! Hey, thanks so much for listening to Ask Me Another, and this would be a great week to check out Planet Money, because the team over there has gone into the oil business. That's right, over the next two weeks, Planet Money is buying crude oil straight from the source and following it all the way to your gas tank. Plus, in classic Planet Money style, they are demystifying the ordinary systems of our economy with humor. Like, what happens when you try to pay cash for 100 barrels of oil? Or beg a refinery to drop in a shampoo bottle of crude oil that you snuck in. Find out on Planet Money this week on NPR One. Find NPR O-N-E on your app store. From NPR and WNYC, coming to you from the Bell House in beautiful Brooklyn, New York, it's NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia, Ask Me Another. I'm Jonathan Colton. Now here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thank you, Jonathan. We have a great show for you. Some genius contestants are backstage waiting to play our nerdy games, rereading the encyclopedia. But only one of them will be today's big winner. And we have three, count them, three special guests. We'll be talking to fashion photographer, blogger, and New York Times bestselling author, Garance Doré, about her favorite topics, love, style, and life. And joining us as well, director Ira Sachs and actor Jennifer Ely. Their new film, Little Men, deals with the themes of love, money, and New York real estate stress. Now, we know many of our listeners live in houses and ranches, compounds, some of them even lairs. But here in New York, we are all squished in tiny apartments. But it's amazing how you adjust. I mean, me and my husband will be sitting side by side on the couch, uh, because that's the only option. (laughs) And I'll ask him a question, and he'll pretend not to hear me. See? (laughs) That's how you create space. Let's get things started and meet our first two contestants. Mia Azar, you are a dental hygiene student, but more importantly, you once threw up on a sea turtle. (laughs) Yes. Mia, are you allergic to sea turtles? We we went on a cruise, it was my honeymoon, and I didn't know I I would get seasick, and I just kept throwing up. (laughs) Like, we finally docked somewhere, Yeah. and they were just in the water, and it just happened to land on them, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> Did they give you one of those sea turtle disappointment looks with a little like, really? I don't know. I was too busy throwing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think sea turtles are always borderline disappointed, right? Well, they're pretty judgy. Pretty judgy. <laughs> they are judgy. <laughs> also, we have Mike Wood. You are a school teacher and you use the Hamilton soundtrack in your classroom. Yes, I do. That sounds like some lazy teaching. <laughs> The kids love it. Of course they do. A couple swears here and there, sneak them in. Right, and they think, ooh, edgy. (laughs) Mike, what is your least favorite children's book? Hop on Pop. Hop on Pop? Or anything by Dr. Seuss. I I can't stand them. Oh, Oh, yeah. (gasps) Whoa, you did not just say that. (laughs) Yeah. People are freaking out right now. (laughs) Hop on Pop is terrible, though. You're not wrong about that. (laughs) And why specifically? Just the, the silly rhyming? Yes, and it's much longer than you would anticipate. Like yeah. Those books are like 75 pages. Right, there should be like two tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Mia, what is your least favorite children's book? It's actually a Dr. Seuss book, too. It's uh, What Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Oh, ah, yeah. And why, why don't you like that one? <laughs> it's also way too long for <laughs> to read. <laughs> so everyone basically is like, if I could spend a little less time with my kids during <laughs> bedtime... <laughs> Well, your game is called the New York Review of Children's Books. 
Jonathan and I are going to read you some imagined hoity-toity reviews of classic children's literature. Just ring in when you know what book we are pontificating about. And then we'll move on to the final round at the end of the show. You ready? Here we go. This book features perhaps the most loathsome character in literature, Mr. I Am. Mr. I Am's attempt to hawk his verdant ovum on some unbefitting stooge are perfunctory and repetitive at best. <laughs> Mia. Sam I Am. Green Eggs and Ham. There you go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct, Mia. The hole punches aren't randomly scattered about, no. They are meaningfully placed, symbolizing the poor larva's starving. He is starving for truth. He is starving for love. He is starving for sausage. <laughs> Mike. The very hungry caterpillar? That's right. <laughs> Was the floppy-eared bunny truly reborn as an enlightened Buddhist in nirvana of his garden? Or was it just an illusion, a Freudian defense mechanism deflecting his fiery doom? My, Mia. The Velveteen Rabbit. Yes, three times, yes. <laughs> Life would be but a feckless empiricism if a mauve-tinted stick of wax could simply materialize one's wishes, as this naive boy believes. Mike. Harold in a purple crayon. That's right. This dim-witted toy deserves to be trapped forever in department store purgatory. Alas, a shameful deus ex machina provides this teddy bear with a missing button for his horribly outdated overalls. <laughs> Mike. Corduroy. Corduroy is correct, yes. <laughs> Sounds like a bitter fashion designer specializing in stuffed toys. <laughs> Terrible. You just had <laughs> to do fashion job. for stuffed animals. Yeah, just Pennington Bear, Yogi Bear. Yeah, all bears. All bears. So sick of putting clothes on yeah, bears. It's like, Winnie the Pooh has no pants. A grand celebration of corruption and political patronage. Mrs. Mallard shamefully grafts the Boston Police Department and subverts basic traffic laws for her offspring. Mike. Make way for ducklings? You got it. Yeah. This is your last clue. The author should heed some tips from his own elements of style. Surely his own rules should condemn a contrived narrative where pigs and spiders converse like grammar school dullards. Mike. Charlotte's Web? Yes, you are correct. <laughs> Let's go to our puzzle guru, Art Chung. Art, how did our contestants do? They both did great, but Mike, congratulations. You're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. Let's meet our next two contestants. Nick Papas, you are a content manager for a comedy website. That's right. Nice. What do you think we need to laugh more at? What do we need to make fun of more often? Oh, it's, uh, it's definitely a good year to laugh at uh, the election. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but do we need to laugh more at the election? <laughs> or do we need to get more? I think more it's the only way we're going to get through it. Yeah. Also, we have Eleanor Wells. You work at a... Startup men's clothing subscription company. That sounds like a dream job. It's really cool. I'm not going to lie. So that's like my husband does this where basically you send them a bunch of stuff uh -huh. and they get to look through it and see what they like and then send back what they don't. And yeah. that's how they get their wardrobe, right? Yeah. What's your office like? It's really fun. Everyone's young and there's lots of dogs all the time, which really? is great. Yeah. <laughs> lots of. <laughs> I like uh -huh. that. <laughs> that you work at the company for the pets. You caught me. Nick, if you could learn any language in its entirety, like just instantly, what would you pick? I think I would choose Spanish. Uh, my wife's family speaks fluent Spanish, yeah. and I'd like to know what they're saying about me. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor, how about you? If you could pick a language to just learn in a minute, what would you pick? I would choose Korean because my manager is Korean and the founders of my company are Korean, and I just want to freak them out. <laughs> like, yeah. coming to work and just like, start. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, what have we been saying? You guys kind of have the same answer for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So as you may know, the German language has a lot of very crazy long 
specific words. Jonathan Colton, why don't you give us an example? Sure. Kummerspeck, literally meaning grief bacon, <laughs> refers to the weight you gain from eating your feelings. <laughs> it's an actual German word. I love it. So in this game, Jonathan and I will be attempting to pronounce German words. We will give you their definitions, and all you have to figure out is whether it's a real word or one we made up for this game. And you should be very careful because if you buzz in and you guess wrong, your opponent will automatically score the point. Remember, you are guessing whether these German words are real or fake. Here we go. Torschluschpanik, or the realization that as life goes on, the scope of one's life becomes smaller and smaller, and no one can never know which opportunities to seize before they are gone forever. Nick. Real. Oh, yeah, that is real. <laughs> there is nothing more German than that. <laughs> That's embroidered on baby pillows. <laughs> Arbeit keine Beleidigung. <laughs> or the process of redoing your mate's chores in secret so that they won't be offended and stop doing the chores in the first place. Nick. Fake. You're right, that is fake. Yeah. You made it up. No one does someone's chores in secret. <laughs> Leben's Abschnitt's partner, a synonym for lover, which translates more directly and perhaps cynically as the person I am with today. <laughs> Nick. That's real. That is real. Yes, you are correct. My current husband hates that word. <laughs> <laughs> your, first, your first husband? Yeah, my first one. Yeah. <laughs> Felscht aufschugeste, or the gesture one makes when only pretending to hold an elevator door open for someone else. <laughs> Eleanor. That's true. No, it's fake. <laughs> it's a real thing, but a fake word. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally a real it's thing. It's totally a real thing. In Germany, they just stare at you. <laughs> <There's no gesture. laughs> Kevin Ismus, or the oft-maligned phenomenon of German parents giving their kids American-sounding names, such as Kevin. <laughs> Eleanor. True. That is true, yes. <laughs> Kevin, is that an American-sounding name? Bobby, I, I guess. To Germans, it's to a Germans, very right. American-sounding yeah, name. Yeah, right, when it's like Axel Werner Helmut. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sticks out. All right, this is your last clue. Drachenfutter, or dragon feed, used to describe a gift brought to one's angry partner when coming home later than promised from the bar. <laughs> Nick. Fake? That is real. Yeah. <laughs> All right, puzzle guru Archung, how did our contestants do in German? It was a close game, but to Nick we say, gut gemacht. We'll see you in our <laughs> final round at the end of the show. Coming up, Jonathan Colton sings about characters who try to take over the world, and strangely, none of them are in Game of Thrones. Plus, what are you wearing while listening to our show? Also a fur bikini with ski goggles? Interesting. We'll be talking love, style, and life with fashion blogger Grance Doré. So stay tuned. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. <laughs> Let's take a moment to thank and share a message from our sponsor, True TV. Misconceptions, myths, and marketing ploys are all around us, but thankfully, Adam Conover is back with new episodes of True TV's Adam Ruins Everything to reveal the awful truth about everything that you take for granted. The electric car won't stop climate change, and buying a home is a terrible investment. Divorce is actually good for society. It's a comedy that will make you see the world a little differently. So check out Adam Ruins Everything, Tuesday at 10 on True TV. 
Support for Ask Me Another also comes from Whole Foods Market. This week, Whole Foods Market is having sales. But this week isn't really special because every week Whole Foods Market has sales. They put yellow stickers and signs all over the store so you can find the highest quality food at the best price, including meat and poultry from farmers and ranchers committed to quality and taste. And organic produce grown without toxic pesticides. So keep an eye out for the yellow the next time you shop and visit WholeFoodsMarket.com to see this week's specials. This is Ask Me Another, NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia. I'm your host, Ophira Eisenberg, here with puzzle guru Art Chung and house musician Jonathan Colton. <laughs> Let's meet our next two contestants. Brendan Mahalko, you're a music teacher. In fact, you were declared the king of music That's by right. one of your students. Why were you declared the king of music? I had a kindergarten student who came up to me, said he wrote me a card. I was so excited to see what was inside, and it was a picture of me with a crown, and said, you are the king of music. So I don't know if he has that authority, but I like to think that I'm now the king of music. <laughs> yes, so. you are. That's awesome. And Lee D. George, you're a three-timed failed game show contestant. Yes, I am. <laughs> Let's what, not make it four. What, <laughs> what were the shows? I, I was on Minute to Win It. Yep. With, and I was on uh, Let's Ask America. Okay. And I was on Million Second Quiz. Wow, okay. And I still have not won anything at all. Well, I'm really happy you're here. Might as well try again, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's time for us to take another famous song and ruin it in the name of trivia. So I'll toss it over to Jonathan Colton. It would be my pleasure, Afira. In this game, we took the Tears for Fears hit, Everybody Wants to Rule the World and rewrote it to be about power-hungry fictional characters and organizations. They can be from films, television, comic books, you name it. Buzz in to answer, and the winner will move on to the final round at the end of the show. You ready? Okay. Welcome to your life. I am watching you. Even while you sleep. Or well, screens catch on good thoughts before they worsen. Though I might not be a person, I'm in charge of Oceania. Uh, Lee. Big Brother. Big Brother is the right answer, yes. Remember that in 1984, we thought we'd be scared of... Security cameras and yeah. documenting our every move. They were wrong. Yeah, we'd just do it ourselves, wouldn't we? That's right. Oh, yeah. Joke's on us. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. I'm a mouse, so you might not find me. Giant eagle with sound like Orson Welles. I'd be ruling if not for Pinky. Lee? Napoleon? <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon is a great guest. <laughs> Incorrect, Brendan. <laughs> he is hanging his head in shame. Brendan, do you know the answer? Uh, the brain? The brain is correct, yes. <laughs> Lee, you were thinking of the show Pinky and Napoleon. <laughs> One is a dumb mouse, the other is a French general. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All kinds of hijinks those guys get up to. Please say hail when you meet us. Avengers try to beat us. Head cut off to more will take its place. Brendan. Hydra? Hydra, you got it. <laughs> First lady who's quite conniving. Frank and I. Don't stop striving. I'm a modern day Lady Macbeth. Lee. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Gotta do it. Sorry. I feel like you've got an axe to grind, Lee. That is, that is incorrect. He said without judgment. Uh, Brendan, do you know the actual answer? Is it the main character from Scandal? No, I'm sorry. That's, that's also incorrect. Anybody, anybody know out there? Claire Underwood. Claire Underwood from House of Cards. Call me the necro-necro-necro-necromancer. You 
want rings and the answer my big fiery eye sees everything Brandon Sauron Sauron that's right This is your last clue Charismatic billionaire my goal is no, not grow hair. I will eliminate the man of steel. Lee, Lex Luthor. You got it. <laughs> I have a good feeling about this. Art Chung, how did our contestants do? Brendan, you're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. <laughs> Our first guest is a fashion photographer, blogger, and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Love Style Life. Please welcome Grants Doré, everybody. <laughs> now, Grants, you started as a street style photographer in Paris. What is a street style photographer? I just started taking photos on the streets of people that I thought were well dressed. Because I didn't know how to dress myself, so I was kind of documenting that learning experience. So you just grabbed a camera? Yep. I just grabbed a camera and I went to people on the street and I was like, you look good, can I take a photo of you? Yeah, no one's saying no to that, right? They did at the time. Oh, they did? Oh, yeah. They're like, no, I'm shy, no. Yeah. And, and then it started becoming a trend. And then people were asking me to take their photos. So basically, you just decided, this is what I want to do as a career. I want to be a fashion photographer of sorts. No, I just, at that time, I wanted to be an illustrator. Yeah. And I was literally losing. I was a loser illustrator. And I, <laughs> I was 30 and broke. And I, cause my mom wouldn't talk to me anymore. And so I was desperate. And I, I couldn't pay for my life anymore. And I was like, my last thing that I'm going to try to do is open a blog. That's when everything started, because I caught that sort of giant wave. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. So does your mother talk to you now? She does. She's proud. I just came back from the city where I was born, and the mayor wants to give me a medal, and she just talks about that all the time. I was like, Mom, I have a bestseller in New York. It's like, you got to go to the city hall. You got to do that. It's like, I don't have to. So see that people kind of focus on what's important for them. But she talks to me. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad. That's for you, Mom. Gross, how do you describe your own style? Uh, pretty white. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, she is wearing all white, except for <laughs> shoes, which are sort of a black I sandal. made an effort on the shoes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wear the same thing every day. Really? Yes. That's Have you been to French Paris? Do? Yeah. Yeah. It's like one very simple, like, f style, you know, like shirt, jean, simple pair of shoes, and that's it. And that's, I think, why it got so famous. It's so easy to recognize. So basically, you look at your wardrobe a little bit like a, a uniform. I, I prefer to unpretentiously say, I have French style. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Uh, now, you have a podcast and web series called Pardon My French in which you talk to different people in fashion and film and culture who inspire you, Stella McCartney, Drew Barrymore, Isaac Mizrahi. So you're talking to all these people. Is there sort of a common thread that you've taken away from speaking to these people of what they uh, think about beauty? <sighs> it's going to sound so stupid and cheesy. No, no. It's just like being yourself. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, a bit slim, but it's it's true. It's just like accepting who you are and all these things and not being perfect and just have fun. But and I'm all wondering, you know, I, so I might say this. And Botox. And Botox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good point. You're talking to a lot of stars, and I'm sure a lot of them, even though they'll like, find your own individual style, individual right. style yeah. Yeah. but at the same time, they are engaged in getting plastic surgery or Botox or whatever it is, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not everybody does it, but it's very common, and it's actually... Uh, I don't know. I don't have anything against it. You know, before, like five or ten years ago, if people were all made, we would kind of look at them in a weird way. And, but now it's totally gone. So I don't know what, what's going to be in five years. Things change so fast, and it's just becoming so normal. 
Yeah, is that scary for you? I have a hard time finding things scary. Like, I'm from the internet. I, and in the beginning, right. people... <laughs> from the internet. <laughs> yep. That's, That's where of, I come from. That is one of the best yeah. things anyone has ever said on the right? stage, by and the way. And in the beginning, people were scared of me in fashion. They were like, ooh, she's from the internet, you know, like, be careful, she's going to say stuff. And so I don't know about judging and, and all that. I just think that people do what they want. And I think in a few years, beauty will be so common. And, you know, that having a normal, non-retouched face will actually maybe become more interesting. Maybe. Maybe we'll go the yeah, other way. Yeah, I think so. Like I really that. do. How do you compare New York style to Paris style? Parisians like to dress the same every day. They're really judgy. They look at each other and like, wow, well, who, who does she think she is, you know? In New York, it's the contrary. I think everybody's curious about what the other person is doing, but it's more like, oh, that's interesting. There's that mix of culture that you never know what you're going to find. It's very interesting. So, Garance, your game is about the two great fashion cities, New York and Paris. I'm going to give you a quote from a famous person. And all you have to do is tell me if that person is talking about New York or Paris. And once you guess, we'll discuss, and then I'll tell you who said the quote. Okay, <laughs> here we go. It's the loudest city on the planet Earth. Garbage men come. They don't pick up the garbage. They just bang the cans together. Garance. New York. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Louis Black said that, a famous comedian. Uh, he yells all the time because he's trying to be heard in New York. <laughs> okay, how about this one? This city is a haven for all women's obsessions. Hot men, great chocolates, scrumptious pastries, sexy lingerie, cool clothes. But as any shoeophile knows, this city is a hotbed of fabulous shoes. Grants. Paris. This is uh, Kristen Loeb from the book Paris Hangover said that. <laughs> It's, it's like all wrong, though. It's, it's just like Paris dream for Americans. Yeah. Sorry. This city is always hopeful. Always it believes that something good is about to come off, and it must hurry to meet it. Grants. It's New York. It is New York. It is that New is York. Correct. That's why I live here. Yeah, that's Dorothy yeah. Parker said that. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. I knew that. Hurry is the word there that gives it away. It's a big rush here. Don't you find, like, the speed? Do you, you like the speed? No, no, I, I actually want to move away, but um, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> it's way too much. It's too much speed. Yeah. Um, but it's, what, does, what did she say in the beginning, the first thing? The city is always hopeful, and it that's, always... That's, that's what I love. Th that New York that is... America and New York, like, oh, so much hope and positivity and all that. I'll never get tired of that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, this is your last clue. Even the pigeons are dancing, kissing, going in circles, mounting each other. Grants. Paris. That is Paris. That's them mounting each other. Yeah, that's the clue. Mm -hmm. So would you say Paris is a sexier city than New York? Yes. Yes, why? Yeah. French people are just about love. They, yeah, they're, I don't know, they have that thing. They just, they're very relaxed about that. Art Chung, Jonathan Colden, do you want to chime in? Nope. <laughs> I love France. <laughs> Art Chung, how did Garance Dore do? She did fantastic, and we're going to give you an uh, Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You should go online and read and listen to everything Garance has to offer. She is online at, guess what? GaranceDore.com, and her podcast and web series is Pardon My French, Let's hear it one more time for Garant Store. Thank you. Let's meet our next two contestants. Amanda Chapin, you, what, collect VHS tapes? Yeah. What's going on there? Well, all the best, and by best I mean like worst movies, never got brought out onto DVD. So, <laughs> I, and before like everything was online, you know, yeah. you could only get them on VHS. And uh, are you looking for something that will end your collection? Like if you could just find this one specific VHS? Um, there's a lot. Actually, there's like whole communities online where they like trade and it's like there's some that go on eBay for like $700. It's really crazy. Yeah. What's the last one you purchased? I don't know the last one, but my favorite one is Nudist Colony of the Dead. <laughs> so. That sounds like a French film. Yeah. <laughs> it's musical. It's a musical? It's a musical? <laughs> fantastic. 
And Kevin Bianchi, yeah. you are on a mission to collect every Meryl Streep movie ever made. Sure am. Sure okay, am. Okay, yeah. <laughs> How many do you own? I'm in about 40. I have like 40. 20 left. What's the hardest one to find? So there's um, this like educational film that she made when she was still at Yale. And it goes for about $140 on Amazon. But I am determined to find it not on Amazon. Yeah. Because that's kind of cheating. Totally. <laughs> it's Just like, order that's it the online. easy way, you know? Like, so like you're going to... You got to dig through those $5 bins. Yes. And <laughs> I like it. Okay. Well, very good. Well, you may or may not know this. E is the most commonly used letter in the English language, but you can never have too much of a good thing. Am I right? So in this game, you'll insert the letter E into a common phrase and turn it into a completely different phrase. Let's go to our puzzle guru, Archung, to give us an example. If I said, after an hour of Soul Cycle, I learned a lot about the bones in my back, you would answer spine class, adding the letter E to spin class. Okay, so each clue will hint at both the original phrase and the new phrase that you get when you add an E. Let's see how it goes. This menacing figure comes with a scythe to collect the souls of the dearly, dirty, departed. Kevin. The grime grim? Grim grime? Okay, you're close. Give, give... The grime reaper. There you go, yes! <laughs> I knew you could do it. <laughs> yes. It's a place where exotic dancers collect dollar bills and place them in evenly spaced horizontal lines. Amanda. The Stripe Club? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> this surprise test is administered to cardinals at the Vatican. Surprise test. Amanda. Pope Quiz. Exactly. <laughs> How about this one? This wearable gadget helps you lose weight by tearing at your flesh with its teeth. Wearable gadget. Oh, Kevin. Is it a fit bite? It is a fit bite, yes. <laughs> I think people would prefer that to steps. <laughs> In high school, this student is clearly the instructor's favorite, probably because he's the lead guitarist of The Who. Amanda. Teacher's peep? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> a really bad choice for the Yankees' new uniforms. The players keep tripping on this superhero cloak as they run. Kevin. A baseball cape? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like something the Yankees would do, right? <laughs> Most expensive capes in the league. All right. <laughs> this is your last clue. This world-renowned R&B group is famous for its song, Midnight Drain to Georgia. Kevin. Gladys Knight and the Pipes. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> Puzzle Guru Archung, how did our contestants do? It was a close game. It came down to the final question. Congratulations, Kevin. You're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. If you want to come on Stag to play our games and win a Rubik's Cub, apply to be a contestant on our show. Just go to amatickets.org and we will send you an email. Coming up, do you know your plays? Do you know your movies? Do you know your plays that have become movies? Well, let's hope our guests do because I'll be talking with director Ira Sachs and actor Jennifer Ely, so stay tuned. I'm Ophira Eisberg and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. <laughs> Another shout out to thank and share a message from our sponsor, True TV. Misconceptions, myths, and marketing ploys are all around us, but thankfully, Adam Conover is back with new episodes of True TV's Adam Ruins Everything to reveal the awful truth about everything you take for granted. The electric car won't stop climate change, buying a home is a terrible investment, and divorce is actually good for society. It's a comedy that will make you see the world a little differently, so check out Adam Ruins Everything, Tuesdays at 10 on True TV. 
Hey, it's Robert and Stacy from the Planet Money team. You know, a lot of places report on the oil business. But we got into the oil business. We bought 100 barrels of crude oil in Kansas. We shipped it, we refined it, and we got it to your gas tank. Check it out on the next few episodes of Planet Money. You can find us on iTunes or NPR One. This is NPR's Ask Me Another. I'm your host, Ophira Eisenberg, and it's time to bring out our next two guests. She's an actor who starred in Zero Dark Thirty, Contagion, as well as the BBC's Pride and Prejudice. He's the director of Love is Strange and Keep the Lights On. Their new movie is called Little Men. Please welcome actor Jennifer Ely and director Ira Sachs. Welcome. Thanks Thank for you. being on the show. Thanks for having us here. Pleasure. Ira, I feel like you were born to be a director. Uh, you spent a lot of your childhood at Sundance because oh, you yeah. were visiting your father there. Yeah, my father moved to Park City in a Winnebago in, uh, <laughs> in awesome. 1972, I guess. He got to Sundance uh, Park City before Robert Redford arrived. And there was a festival there for film, and, and I started going to the movies uh, when I was 12, and I would go there just to visit my dad and, and go to the movies for, during that festival. After college, you went to Paris, but did you see Paris? No, you didn't. I did not. Uh, I was a very lonely, uh, non-French-speaking Memphian in Paris uh, who had no friends, and so I saw two or three movies a day. I saw 197 movies in a three-month period. <laughs> Changed my life. And then you applied f to some top film schools, uh, NYU being one of them, did not get in. I did not get into any of the film schools I applied to. But then you became a filmmaker, okay. and then taught at NYU in yes. the graduate program. Yes, I went back with a vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what was it like teaching at a program that rejected you? Uh, well, you know, I actually felt that there was some advantage of never being um, taught how to make films, but only sort of learning it instinctually. I had a sense um, from a very young age that I was actually making things that were meaningful in the world. And I think that's something that film school often takes away from people. They feel like the teacher has to give them approval. So I always tried to give my students kind of the initiative to take their work seriously. And have a, a specific voice, allow yourself to have a voice. Exactly. And I think that there is, within film school, a sense that um, there's always something you're supposed to make that other people are making. And what I would always tell my students is probably, like, if they made a film about their mother, it would be the most personal film and the most specific film and, and actually be one that people care about. Yeah. Do you know why, in hindsight, they rejected you? Uh, stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Now, Jennifer, I'm a huge fan. I read uh, that when you're not working, you live on a farm and you raise chickens and play <laughs> board games, which basically makes you exactly like most of our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so just to make them happy, what kinds of chickens are you raising? Well, we only have two chickens okay, at the moment. Okay, that's okay. That's um, okay. We had seven two weeks ago, but... Um Something eight, five of them. Was it um, oh. was was it you? Do, no. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Okay. It was oh. not. <laughs> it was a chicken hawk. It was a chicken hawk or a bear um, or a fox. But um, one of the chickens, Plato, pretentiously named Plato, <laughs> she got very broody right after um, this happened. Maybe as a response to the flock being decimated, and she wouldn't leave the nesting box. We thought she was traumatized at first, but she's broody, and we don't have a rooster, so nothing. Was going to happen to those eggs she was sitting on. So we got six eggs from a farmer friend and slipped them under her, and she has taken to them. And no. she is there, sitting on them right now. And she's been sitting on them for a week. And if she lasts another two weeks, then we might have six roosters. <laughs> and I don't know well. what we would, I don't know what they'll be. We don't know what. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's a surprise. So it's very exciting. And what's your favorite board game of the board games you're playing? Oh, God. You know, I love Clue, yeah. and nobody will play Clue with me. But Why I not? Love, my family doesn't like it. I love Risk as well. No. You don't like Risk? <laughs> no you clue. were good at Risk, I bet. I, I was terrible I at Risk. I can tell. I was terrible at Risk. <laughs> now, Jennifer, you kind of grew up on stage. Your mother's a famous actress, Rosemary Harris, and, you know, people know her from TV and film and movies. A lot of our listeners uh, would know her, of course, as Aunt May from Spider-Man, because we have a lot of superhero fans. Uh, and in 2000, you and your mom were nominated 
for Tonys. Mm. Right in the category of best actress in a play. Yes. Both of you up against yes. each other, and then you won. Yes. What was that car ride home like? <laughs> <laughs> It was, I, my mother couldn't be more wonderful and supportive, and we were both thrilled to be nominated. Neither of us expected to win, and um, she was very generous and always is. Yeah, she never has said, uh, I made no. you who you are. <laughs> Did she ever do that? No, no. never. <laughs> Let's talk about the new film, Little Men. Ira, I will let you describe this film in your words. The film is about two boys who are 12 and 13 who become best friends at the same point and moment where their parents become worst enemies. So it's a film about childhood. And specifically, it's set in a corner of Brooklyn where they're fighting over a very particular uh, storefront. One set of parents owns it, the other one rents it, and there's a problem over the lease. Um, so it's also about the changing nature of, of neighborhoods and, and, and the Brooklyn that I know. Yeah, that is constantly changing. And Jennifer, you've played so many different roles. Obviously, a lot of people know you from Pride and Prejudice, uh, but you've done Shakespeare, you've played spies. In this film, you play a mother who's a psychologist and dealing with uh, her son and, and these issues. What drew you to this role when you read the script? This was one of the most beautiful scripts I'd read, and um, it's very truthful, and it's, it's about love and people, and you really feel like you get to know these people intimately, and um, that's quite a rare experience in film. Right, yeah. a, a very deep character study. Mm. So we have these relationships, we have the uh, money problems, and then this impact of New York real estate, mm -hmm. uh, which in Love is Strange, there's also a... Uh, a, a theme of New York real estate really impacting the main character's lives. Right. So I understand this because I live here, but how do you feel someone in another part of the country? Well, I think it's um, pretty clear that everyone worries about where they're going to live and how they're going to pay for it. I sort of feel like if you get the details right, then it will resonate widely. Yeah. And do other New Yorkers come up to you and ask you about any of the apartments that are in the film. You were the first. I was the first? <laughs> yeah. I'm obsessed with this. Um, as I told you, it was a fiction. So yes. that apartment, uh, yes. don't go looking like, for that apartment. How did you apartment. get that apartment? <laughs> Ira, you founded and curated a film festival called Queer Art Film, uh, and actually you've created a mentorship program to promote queer film artists. What would you like to see more of when it comes to LGBT film? Money. Just more money. It needs to be fun. Well, I would, I would like to see a whole apparatus that supports and encourages the... Uh, it gives artists the permission to tell these stories. Capitalism does not do that. So I try to create an apparatus that allows that. Um, and if you've got any money, come talk to me. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I sort of make that as a joke, but I actually think that in some ways my films are all about money. They're all about how people try to navigate through the very complicated sort of... Uh, negotiations that you have to make it to, in a daily life around um, income. Now, you said as a screenwriter, you write 90% of it, but you leave 10% up for improv. Yes. Often I want tension between the documentary kind of very realistic elements and the more scripted material in the film. And, and what it does is it makes the whole film feel, I think, to audiences very familiar. They know those people because they're not controlled by the director or the filmmaker in every moment. More authentic. Alfred Molina, who I've now worked with on Love is Strange in this film, said that I'm a director who that wants everyone to be extremely free and don't follow anything but to get all the lines exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, are you guys ready for your Ask Me Another Challenge? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so Jennifer, you've won two Tonys. Ira, you're a huge cinephile, so here's your game. Jonathan Colton and I will perform dramatic readings from movies that were adapted from plays. Oh, wow. That either won or were nominated for Tony Awards. Uh -huh. Okay, we're excited. What do you think of that? Right. Yeah. yeah. So all you have to do is buzz in and identify the work. And I just want to let you know right now, I respect both of you. And what we're going to do right here as far as acting. <laughs> acting is it's generous. A, it's a joke. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, here we go. In 1928, I had a big year. I averaged $170 a week in commissions. Now, Willie, you never have... I averaged $170 a week in the year of 1928. Ira. Death of a salesman. That is correct. Hey, well done. Willie, Willie, Willie. was what gave it away. Willie, I know. Did you know that one, Jennifer? No. <laughs> 
So far, so good. <laughs> Fix me another drink, lover. My God, you can swill it down, can't you? Well, I'm thirsty. Oh, Jesus. Look, sweetheart, I can drink you under any goddamn table you want, so don't worry about me. I gave you the prize years ago, Martha. There isn't an abomination award going that you haven't won. I swear to God, George, if you even existed, I'd divorce you. Jennifer. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Did that hurt you, seeing us do that? I was wondering if you're going to switch. No, you're not going to switch gender roles here. You're going to... No, we're totally normative uh, here. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Why can't you lose your good looks, Brick? Most drinking men lose theirs. I think you've even gotten better looking since you went on the bottle. You were such a wonderful lover. You'll be late. Oh, Brick, how long does this have to go on? This punishment. Haven't I served my term? Can't I apply for a pardon? <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to invite. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Matter of fact, the next line in the play is... Cat on the hot tin roof. <laughs> the cat on the hot tin roof. <laughs> exactly. Look, when you're in office, you got to do a lot of things sometimes that aren't always in the strictest sense of the law, legal. But you do them because they're in the greater interest of the nation. Wait, just so I understand correctly, are you really saying that in certain situations the president can decide whether it's in the best interest of the nation and then do something illegal? I'm saying that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Hmm. Uh, I have no idea. Oh, let's go to no. Puzzle Guru Archon. Pretty Christine. Woman. Some <laughs> <laughs> Tony Award winning play, Pretty Woman. Uh, this was nominated for a Tony in 2007, but lost to Coast of Utopia. Oh. And it starred Frank Langella and Michael Sheen in the original West End production. And it was by um, Pete Morgan. That is correct. Yeah, so I know the playwright, but I don't know the name of it. Nixon. Um, yes. Nick Frost. Yes. yes. Frost, Frost Nixon. Nixon. Frost Nixon. That's correct. That's correct. We'll give you each a point for that. Yeah. <laughs> this is your last clue. And now I'm just going to warn you, we had to replace the curse words with a phrase that would be acceptable to NPR standards and practices. Oh. So don't let that throw you. Fudge. That's actually a little too close <laughs> for NPR standards and practices. So let's talk about something important. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. You think I'm pledge driving with you? <laughs> I am not pledge driving with you. <laughs> I'm here from downtown. I'm here from Mitch and Murray. And I'm here on a mission of mercy. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You got it. <laughs> it was the performance that really did I it. I really sold it. I really sold it. Yeah. Let's go to our puzzle guru, Art Chung. Well, we have a tie. Whoa, we have a tie. <laughs> oh, that's how we wanted it. One more buzzer question. This is a short one. Whoever you are, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. Streetcar named Desire. That is correct. Congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Thanks to both of you for playing from Little Men. Let's give it up for Ira Sachs and Jennifer Ely. Now we're going to crown this week's big winner. Let's bring back Mike, Nick, Brendan, and Kevin to play our final round. Puzzleger Archung, take it away. Thanks, Ophira. This final round is called Heating Up the Competition. Every answer will contain an object that can be found in a kitchen. So, for example, if I said, it's the star of Legally Blonde who won an Academy Award for her role in Walk the Line, that'd be Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> We're playing this spelling bee style, so one wrong answer and you're out. You only have a few seconds to give me that answer, and the last person standing is our big winner. Your prize is an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube, an autographed copy of Grant Story's book, Love Style Life, autographed pages from the script for Little Men, signed by Ira and Jennifer, and tickets to the IFC film series Queer Art Film, which Ira co-curates. Here we go. Mike, this host of This American Life began his public radio career as an NPR intern. Oh my God, Ira Spoon? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. He's gonna be so mad when he hears this. Nick, do you know the answer? Ira Glass. Ira Glass is the answer. Thanks, Mike, for playing. Brendan, this small furry creature debuted in Return of the Jedi. Ewok? Ewok is correct. 
Kevin, Russia is scheduled to host this international soccer sporting event in 2018. Um, I have to give you three seconds. He's dancing. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you couldn't pull it out. Nick, do you know the answer? The World Cup. That is correct. We have to say goodbye to Kevin. And we are quickly down to two players, Brendan and Nick. Brendan, it's the large amount of money you can win playing a lottery like Mega Millions or Powerball. Jackpot? Jackpot is correct. <laughs> Nick, it's a nickname for a member of the U.S. Marine Corps and the title of a 2005 film starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Something head. Uh, jarhead. That is correct. You pulled it out. <laughs> nice pull, Nick. Brendan. A type of hard liquor that can be distilled from almost any grain, from rye or barley to quinoa, and usually aged in wood barrels. Whiskey? Whiskey is correct. <laughs> Nick. It's the Greek mathematician referred to as the father of geometry. Archimedes? No, that's not the one we're looking for. Brendan. <laughs> Name a Greek mathematician. Euclid? Euclidean? That's correct. Congratulations, Euclid. Well done. Brendan, you did it. You're Ask Me Another big winner. Enjoy your prize. Congratulations. That's our show. Thank you so much for playing for bonus games and stuff too hot for radio. Look us up on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our podcast on Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Come see us live or be a contestant. Go to amatickets.org. Ask Me Another's puzzle guru is Art Chung. Hey, my name anagrams to Narc Thug. Our house musician is Jonathan Colton. Thou Jolta Cannon. Our puzzles were written by Eric Feinstein, Mary Tobler, and senior writers Kyle Beakley and Karen Lurie. Ask Me Another's produced by Keanu Fitzgerald, Mike Katzeff, Travis Larchuk, Julia Melfi, and Denny Shin, along with Anya Grunman. We are recorded by Bill Moss, Kristen Moeller, and David Hurtkin. Ask Me Another was created by Eric Newsom and Jesse Baker. We'd like to thank our home in Brooklyn, New York, The Bell House. Hot Heel Blues. And our production partner, WNYC. I'm her ripe begonias. Ophira Eisenberg. And this was Ask Me Another from NPR. <laughs> Next time on Ask Me Another, indie folk duo The Milk Carton Kids talk about the challenges of being in a two-man band. I always thought it'd be really rewarding to be in a duo. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Join me, Ophira Eisenberg, with the hilariously dry Milk Carton Kids on NPR's Hour of Puzzles, Word Games, and Trivia. City train.